We are delighted to kick off the academic year with a topic that is of tremendous relevance and importance here in Qatar and in the region. And we are particularly excited to have one of the preeminent experts in the topic share his thoughts and insights with us. George Nofal uh, is a professor of economics at the American University of Sharjah. He holds a PhD in economics from Texas A&M University. We won't hold that against him for not having a PhD from Georgetown, that's okay. He's a research fellow at the uh, Institute for the Study of Labor, and he is an advisor to the Ministry of Labor in the United Arab Emirate. Tonight, he will talk about the economics of migration in the GCC. Please join me in welcoming George Novel. All right, good evening. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to thank Mahran and Zahra and the Center for International and Regional Studies, Georgetown Doha, for this opportunity uh, to talk to you guys about something that I've been working on for the last several years and I'm very passionate about. Um, so today, I'm, I don't have a lot of slides. I just have some of the things that I want to highlight. But the first thing I want to show you is just an outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about brief history of migration in the Gulf, uh, determinants, why do, do people come here, why did they come here, the type of migration, and uh, migrants, who came, and, and you know, is there anything special about them. The next section is going to be one of the main consequences of migration, which is remittance outflows. I'm going to talk about the size, an interesting story about their direction, and consequences, uh, you know, or potential consequences. And the last thing I'm going to open up for challenges and opportunities that the region is actually facing, the Gulf, the GCC countries, mainly locally labor markets and also regionally and also globally. So economists always believe people move because the expected income in the, at the destination is higher than the current income at the current uh, uh, place or country. You know, not just the you know, expected income in the sense that the current expected income, but also the present value, the future expected income. And that's exactly really what happened uh, in, in the GCC countries. People came here for two reasons. One, because they were needed, and two, because the expected income uh, in the Gulf was higher than what they were making. But what made this? How could, did the GCC countries were able to make a difference basically in the wage gap or increase or have a wage gap. There are two types of factors. The first set of factors are factors related to the Gulf that made the GCC countries an attractive destination. Uh, these were basically, obviously, and everyone is going to expect them, these were discovery of large uh, oil reserve and natural gas. So the hydrocarbon you know, uh, 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 if you want uh, 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 richness of the region. Now, there is an interesting story here that the first oil field was found in Iran in 1909, and then after that moved to Bahrain, and then from Bahrain to Saudi Arabia in the you know, 1930s, 1940s, and then moved to Qatar, the UAE, and Kuwait. Now, I, I actually invite you to go read the story because initially, after founding uh, you know, oil in, in Iran and looking in the, in the region, uh, it took three years without finding any oil. And in fact, some of the geologists that were working during that time, they went against uh, uh, the company's orders. And the company was, I think, Standard Oil Company in, in California, which I think became Chevron, uh, because they were called out. But they decided they believed truly that there is oil. And once they struck oil in Saudi Arabia, that changed the whole region. Uh, in fact, the modern Saudi Arabia that you know, we know of is, is because of uh, that, that moment. So, the GCC countries have a lot of oil. Uh, uh, they have large reserves. This is historically in terms of since they were found, since where they were production, in terms of natural reserves, in terms of production. Uh, the numbers change, uh, but you, you, you hear almost 50% of the world's reserves are found in the Gulf, uh, you know, more or less, depending on, on the years and depending on uh, um, how you actually uh, count them. The same applies for production uh, for, for oil, for natural, crude oil, and also uh, uh, natural gas. Now, that's one. So you, you, the GCC countries could afford it, 
basically foreigners. But the other thing is they needed them too. Why did they need them? Because the population in the region was very small. I'll give you an example. In 1981, when the GCC Council was formed, the population of, uh, was around 15 million in the whole Gulf. Now, that included a lot of foreigners too. I don't know actually how many. But 15 million on a large piece of land, and that land is almost 30% of the United States. So 15 million and almost 30% if you want in the United States. So there was plenty of land and a very small population. Add to it very ambitious development projects, because you can actually fund those, you needed labor, and you needed labor fast. Now, you can also add another aspect, is that the population was small, but also inexperienced. Inexperienced because the countries here were not at the same level of industrialization relative to other Arab, neighboring Arab countries. You know, look at the mid-1900s, if you look at you know, Lebanon versus the GCC countries, if you look at Egypt versus the GCC countries, you, you can easily see the difference. So they, were, they could afford them. They were small, inexperienced, and very young, too. Less than 2% you know, of the population was above 65 years old, which is actually the same story for the Middle East, for the GCC countries. We still have a very young uh, population. So the ultimate goal was to develop and develop fast. And the best way to do so is to bring labor. Now, I'm going to stop here. And I'll tell you where they brought the labor once, once actually we move forward with the presentation. So on one side, they could actually afford them. They needed them. So, so one side of the story was there. What about the other side of the story? Why would people come to the Gulf? So even if somebody wanted you, and even if somebody could afford you, if you were happy at home, it would be more difficult for you to leave. Well, let's look at the other side. The other side. I'm going to start with the you know, non-GCC Arab countries, the, so the Middle East countries. If you look since World War II, up until before the Arab Spring, up until 2010, the Middle East has had 28 serious conflicts. When I say serious conflicts, it's large wars. I'm not talking about the other almost 100 small revolutions and fighting and and, and, and conflict on the ground. So 28 serious wars with at least 1,000 deaths and several thousand you know, injured. You're talking about the most volatile region in the world. Now, the geographical location of these conflicts was not random. In fact, in the GCC, only two, and they are almost actually one, which is the 1990-1991 first Gulf War. So the invasion of Kuwait, and then after that, the first Gulf War. You can actually have them won. And this is the only conflict that occurred in the GCC. Other than that, every, all the conflicts occurred in the neighboring region. So you had one major role, one major factor for people to leave their country because it was actually very unstable. Another factor is because economic performance. So there were just no job opportunities. No job opportunities, high unemployment, unemployment rate, if you can actually find the numbers in the Middle East, you will find them randomly um, and for different years. But in most cases, it was always above 10, and in fact, probably even more uh, above 20%. The latest IMF report puts the youth unemployment in the Middle East around to, to, to around 22%. So, you're a, you're, a, you're a Syrian, you're Palestinian, you're Jordanian, you're, you're Egyptian, you're Yemeni, you're Sudanese, and, and you're thinking, you know, there's war, there's conflict, it's, it's not, you know, there's no, no jobs. Yeah, you know, it's really a dead end. However, there's a potential opportunity in the Gulf. Now, if you look at other <coughs> source of labor, which are non-Arab uh, uh, countries, so South Asian and Southeast Asian, you can also find that the economic performance was also not good, mainly because of actually large population. If you look at India, if you look at Pakistan, if you look at Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, you have large population. So when you look at standards of living, when you look at income per capita, one of the main measures that economists uh, you know, use, then you're going to find it's actually very low uh, income per capita. So 
So put these together. You had reasons to push you out of your country and the reasons to actually welcome you. Put, once, once you put them together, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a large, 1990s and 2000s, large flows of, of people to uh, uh, the Gulf. Now, I want to actually tell you something. Uh, the latest, the most recent independence is 1971, right? So this is the last uh, formation of a GCC country. After that, there was the oil embargo. And during that time, people actually refer to it as the largest transfer of wealth in human history. So the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia you know, at first, received the largest transfer of wealth in human history. In fact, it's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, and this is in the 1970s. However, the GCC countries shared it with the, with the, with the world by how? By inviting foreigners from basically almost all countries. So that said, how can we actually see it on the ground? Well, if you look at 2010, you can see that the standards of living in Qatar is 23 times that of Sri Lanka. Again, I'm using the income per capita, which is a, a common measure for the standards of living. It's actually 35 times of Yemen, 50 times of Sudan, and 70 that of Bangladesh. Now, um, so this is in general terms. What about on a personal level? If you were an Egyptian farmer in the 70s and you came to Saudi Arabia, you made 30 times more your salary. In the 80s, if you were a school teacher in Egypt, you made 20 times your salary. In the 90s, if you're a Jordanian engineer, you tripled your income by moving to Kuwait. So that I'm saying the wage gap is really, really high. In fact, I told you that the Middle East is the, the region that has the largest number of conflict. It's actually the region that has the largest variation of standards of living, the largest region that has the largest variation. If you put Yemen, if you put Sudan, if you put Syria, Iraq on one side, and if you put the GCC countries on the other side, you will see the, this, and actually you see the numbers right there. So what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to say that the determinants to come to the uh, Gulf mainly came from both sides and mainly you know, uh, 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 focus on large wage gap that even touched personal individuals and people actually felt it uh, you know, by moving to the Gulf. And it was very safe, very stable. Now, if you actually divide the Middle East, you're going to divide them by all exporters, all importers. You can also divide them by labor importers and labor exporters. It's actually almost the same, uh, you know, uh, 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 classifications. And you can even divide them by safe versus, you know, stable versus unstable, with the exception of Iraq. Iraq is the only one that has actually lar that had large, uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbon reserves, but also had conflicts. Now. Uh, uh, Interestingly, the reasons existed for everybody to come, whether from Arab neighboring countries or whether from uh, South Asian, a little bit you know, further uh, uh, down. Now, um, we talked about the determinants. Now we're going to talk about the type of migration. So we know why people came to the Gulf, but I want to know what kind of migration we're talking about. Do people come here for long term? I mean, is this, is this something that you can actually bring your family and do something that you can actually, you know, settle down? If you look at traditional destination for migration, whether North America or whether Europe, then you have long term plans. You, bring, you come in, let's say you go to school, you can actually maybe find a job, get your family and slowly get some sort of separation from your home country. This to a certain extent, it's not really true in the, in GC, in the GCC countries. It's a temporary migration uh, uh, phenomenon. So all the studies talk about migration. We, we use the same term, but it may not be the, you know, very accurate. In fact, the GCC countries, in many official meetings, they struggle in terms of how do they want to call them. Are they actual migrants? Uh, are they expatriates? Are they foreign workers? Are they contract workers? Who are they? And that's actually kind of sensitive topic because when you say migration, you say somebody who could actually come and you know, get the local citizenship and stay. So what the type of migration basically is divided into, I mean, is seen in the following. If you come here, you cannot get a 
citizenship. There's no path for citizenship. Unless there is an extreme, extreme, uh, uh, you know, in an extreme case. For example, Rafi al Hariri, who was the prime minister uh, uh, of Lebanon, became a Saudi citizen. But he was very close to, to the king. And actually, he had you know, major contribution in Saudi Arabia. But beyond that, you should forget it, basically. Number two, you cannot own property. Now, in the last you know, few years, and I, I'm, I'm going to say Dubai because I'm aware of what's going on, they're trying to push that forward. They're trying to actually find a way for ownership of real estate. But there is a big question mark. The latest U.S. Uh, department said, you know, report says, at the end of the day, you, you still, you know, there are plenty of things, but you just don't own it. You know, you may own what's above the land, but not the land. So, no citizenship and no real estate ownership. Number three, if you are unskilled, and I'm going to say unskilled, you can measure different ways, but in, in this way, is that you make less than a certain amount of money a month, you cannot bring your family members, your immediate family members. Uh, in the UAE, the latest figure is $2,700 a month. If you make less than that, you're going to be by yourself. If you make above that, you can actually sponsor your uh, family. So no citizenship, no ownership uh, of real estate, you're most likely going to be by yourself. I'm going to talk about skilled and unskilled numbers in a second. The fourth one is they are really tough. This, I mean, this country is very tough on expatriates. The laws are very strict and very tough. Uh, I'll give you very, a simple example. Kuwait recently has been deporting foreigners and expatriates based on traffic violations. So traffic violations could be, you know, you ran a red light. Okay, that's, that's serious. But could be also carpooling. So, you know, so fine, yeah, you know, come in, let's go. For many expatriates, this is not really a serious uh, a crime, but it could actually lead to your deportation and loss of that income and, and job. And also, in, in most cases, banned for life. Now, all of these four are all negative in the sense that if, you're, if you want to come to the Gulf, you're like, why should I come? And this is one, two, three, uh, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. People know these even before they come. In fact, you know, many people have friends here, many foreign and potential expatriates. They, they, you, know, you hear, you read, these days information uh, uh, transfer is very uh, large, but you still decide to come. Um, and the reason you start to come, again, wage gap and stability, but also because there is a large, what I'm going to call it, an infinite supply of labor. Maybe not at, at, at every skill level, but definitely at an unskilled level. In fact, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at the GCC, they can recruit from India, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, from Pakistan, or from the Arab countries. And because of the economic performance and instability, especially recently in the Arab countries, then the number of people willing to come is very large, almost unlimited. If you add the population across all these countries, you have more than half the population of the world. So the GCC countries actually see them as perfect substitutes to, you know, you made, you made a mistake, we deport you, we can bring, you know, 10 others exactly who are willing to come. Now, that said, so we talked about determinants, and we talked about the type, we're going to talk about the migrants. So who actually come here? To be honest, we, we, we I mean, we, we know, but not to a certain extent we would like to know. Those who come here are young, usually, and are usually male, specifically unskilled labor, specifically construction workers. Um, they're usually actually single and not very educated. And the reason is, I mean, this is actually being diluted by the availability and the, you know, the large number of unskilled workers. If you remove them, then you, you might see uh, more educated, uh, 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 you know, a larger share of people with college degrees, but the majority have actually high school degree. Now, in terms of gender ratio, because of the unskilled workers, the con you know, construction workers, in Qatar, if you are between 25 and 54, the, the male to female ratio is five to one. So I always tell my friends, 
If you're a single male, you don't want to go to Doha. <laughs> I'm not going to find a wife, that's for sure. Now, that number is exactly 3 to 1 in the UAE. In Lebanon, it's exactly the opposite. It's five women to one man for, other, for another social issue. Now, uh, that said, I'm talking, I'm talking about the temporary nature of, migra uh, of migrants, and I'm telling you basically that you know, it's mainly male. You have to know that temporary doesn't mean that you cannot stay here for a long time. In fact, there are several, you know, uh, 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 you know, several cases and examples of people who have been here for decades. Uh, you have a sponsor, you know, you, the sponsor uh, you know, renews your visa and, 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 and you continue to stay. You have kids and your kids actually are here. But at the same time, you know that eventually this is not a retirement place. I mean, people don't come here for retirement. Okay, they come here for work. Now, that said, there's an also interesting story uh, in terms of the nationality makeup of uh, the, the, the countries here. The expatriates, I'm sorry, in the, in the GCC countries. So when, after the independence in 1971, large you know, a, 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 a production and export of, of oil, large foreign currency reserves coming into the Gulf, you know, oil embargo, largest you know, transfer of wealth, who came first? It was the non-GCC Arabs who came first in the 70s and the 80s. The reason is just because they speak the language, in most cases, they share the, the, the religion and culture, and also they are close, proximity. So mainly, actually, uh, you know, Arabs came to the GCC. But that changed and started to change in the mid-80s slowly. So what did the GCC countries, they, I, I think, realize, and I'm going to tell you why, that the Arab workers are actually annoying. They're troublesome. I mean, they, they, they're, they're bringing trouble. I'll tell you why in a second. So in, starting in the mid-'80s, they started slowly to not renew visas for Arabs and easily replace them with, slowly replace them with South Asian and Southeast Asian workers. Now, when that started in the, in the, in the 80s, the sudden shock event of the 1990-1991 war, which is the Gulf War, it actually made the process much faster. In fact, that was a really a structural break in the nationality or in the source of workers. Before that, majority were Arabs. After that, majority are Asians. For many reasons, mainly related to geopolitics. So during the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the Palestinian government, the Yemeni government, for example, stood with the Iraqi, with the Saddam regime. Well, then Saudi Arabia deported what people estimate between 600 and 700,000 Yemenis from Saudi Arabia, 300,000 Palestinians from Kuwait, and uh, uh, in other places. These were the documented ones. And in fact, the literature on migration in the Gulf is clear about that. This is not something I, you know, I have done. What I, what I added to it, I'll show you in a, in a second, something that you can actually see on paper that remittances basically showed it to us. All right, so we talked about determinants, we talked about type, we talked about migrants, we're gonna talk about now uh, remittances, but let me show you this number first. The estimates put the, the non-GCC Arabs in the 70s to be around 70% of the labor force, and the Asians less than 20%. That's exactly almost the opposite in 2005. That's the latest number I could get. Um, why this happened? Because the GCC countries saw the Arab workers with great suspicion. They were suspicious of them. They were suspicious of them because they brought domestic ideologies from home that were not very welcome in the Gulf. They brought also um, other potential you know, ideas. Uh, I'm going to link that to Egypt in a second. Number two, they also found, the GCC found out that the Asian workers were superior. They were economically superior. Why? Because they could pay them less. They could, the Asian workers would accept worse working conditions. Um, 
you know, also borderline abuse of the work, uh, of, uh, work environment or work workforce. And also, they found out too that Arab workers, you know, want to come and stay and want to bring family. And also, uh, Arab women usually don't come alone, so they want to bring the whole family. That's, that's, an, you know, that's an issue. You don't want to do that. While, uh, you know, South Asian uh, for workers would come alone. In fact, even, you know, women, for example, women from Bangladesh, women from Sri Lanka would come alone. So they, they, they preferred that. This is, a, you know, the, 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 that invasion of Kuwait was a very clear, and I'll show you in a second, uh, a division in, in terms of the source of labor. And actually, I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to actually throw this at you. I think the same thing is happening now with what's going on in, outside the GCC. I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. If you want to hire somebody, a foreigner, you want to bring him here, anywhere in the Gulf. Let's say he's from Egypt. Then uh, is he you know, Muslim Brotherhood? Is he non-Muslim Brotherhood? Is there an issue here? So let's bring an Indian guy. It's better. It's, less, it's, it's actually less headache. So maybe in five years, we are going to actually see some of the uh, consequences of that, uh, like I'm going to show you in, in a second. All right, so let's talk about remittance of, uh, uh, from the Gulf. Now, remittance are the money sent by migrants back home. And remittance has been growing you know, in the last three, you know, several decades. People have actually worked on them. Researchers, you know, uh, policy makers, academicians, because the large, uh, because they are, they, because they are large, the number of you know amount of remittance have increased tremendously. They, they're above five hundred billion dollars now. That is estimated by the World Bank, and they're much less volatile, much more stable than, you know, foreign direct investment and foreign aid. In fact, during the last uh, recession. Remittances in many countries, you know, declined by 5%, but never, and then after that increased. In fact, the remittances from the GCC did not show any uh, sign of so slowing down. Uh, there are many ideas behind why that happened. But now let me ask you this. If you are living in a country that you cannot own land, you cannot get a citizenship, you cannot bring your family, at any time you have to leave and you know it's temporary, what would you do? You send money back home as much as you can. Because you know eventually you're going to go back. So if you are in Europe or if you are in North America, there is a potential of you staying and there is a potential of bringing your family. So eventually that sending money back home might die down, but not here. In fact, you, you have all the reasons for you to send money and send money as much as you can. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the research we've seen, and we, we need much more uh, evidence, people send more than 12 times a year. So in other, time, other sense, they send more than one once a month. So they are, it's a very dynamic remittance uh, uh, market. And uh, UAE Exchange, for example, it's a big company here, accounts for almost 5% of remittances in the world, mainly from the region. So how big are remittances? This shows you the share of remittances from the Gulf to the total remittances in the world. I wanted to, to show this first because it actually gives you an idea that, okay, so the remittance data in the 70s is a little bit questionable, but once you look, you know, you have a, a, a stable between 25% and 15% of any $1 basically remittances in the world comes from the Gulf. If you want to think about it, it's basically one fourth, one fifth comes of remittances in the world come from the GCC. Uh, and, you know, there was some slowing down here, but then actually uh, it went up. Again, why do people remit? We told you, we, we told you because you cannot really stay. So you want to build a way for you to go back, you know, build a house or, you know, get yourself ready. But also because there is a large share of migrants in, as, a, as a percentage of the population in the Gulf. This shows you the percentage, the mean percentage of the GCC population as foreigners. Uh, you know, it, it, it increased, in fact, reached above 50% uh, for several years. And now it went down, and uh, we have to actually add a few more years. It, it's hovering around 50%. Now, this is from the population. If you take the labor force, which means only those who are working, it's actually much higher than that. UAE and Qatar are notorious for having more than, above 90% of, of the labor force as foreigners. In fact, uh, the UAE's estimation for the population is 8 million. 
currently in the UAE, and less than 1 million are Emiratis. Uh, so around 900,000. They, they try they push it to, to 1 million, just, you know, 1 million looks better than less than 1 million. Um, now, that said, if you look at these numbers, you're going to tell me, well, how important is the Gulf in terms of a migration, uh, 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 you know, debate? Well, the GCC countries are the third labor importing region in the world after North America and Europe. And North America and Europe historically, basically, were, you know, destination for people le leaving. So the GCC countries is very, very important in that sense. Okay, so, so now they, we know that they send money. Uh, um, how much money? Well, in 2011, the official, so this is what we know, is $71 billion from the GCC countries. The largest from any region in the world. In fact, the largest remitter is the United States, single country, with around $50 billion. If you put the GCC together, it's, it's more than that. Saudi Arabia, historically, in the last five years, ranks second after the US, with almost $30 billion money sent from the GCC outside. I mean, if you look at this number and you look at the, G, you know, the national production of countries close to the GDP, this is above. It's more than, you know, it's the GDP of Lebanon every year. Now, this is also official, meaning if I put money in my pocket and, and, I, and I go to Jordan and give it to my mom, we don't know how much it is. The estimate is that probably it's twice that 70. So, so it's definitely more than $100 billion. Now, this obviously, uh, uh, it, you know, raises the question. So, uh, shall we worry about this? I mean, uh, from a GCC perspective, I'm a government. Shall I worry about having uh, uh, money basically leaking every year? Significant amount. This is as you're trying to, you know, uh, fill a bathtub, and there's a big hole. And you, took, you put more money, and then, more, and then you put more money, in, uh, put more water, and the water is actually flowing. So, there's a, a big question. I'm going to talk about it when I talk about consequences in a, in a second. The main point I want to show you is this. So the literature was very clear about the nationality makeup of the, of the region, about the structural break in terms of the importing of labor. But what I added is this. So one day I was playing around with data, and I looked at, so the blue is the amount of remittances from the Gulf, from the six countries. And the red is the amount of remittances coming to the Middle East without the six countries. I even excluded also uh, you know, uh, Turkey. But Iran is there. Um, so what do you see? If you look at it, you see that actually outflows from the Gulf and inflows to the Middle East match each other up until mid to late 80s. Then. The, red, the blue one, which is the money from the Gulf, actually stays up. It's actually going. But the other one goes down. Or at least it doesn't keep up with it. And that's why you see this big you know, hole. Now, let's talk about this before I actually move to the other side. So what does this mean? It means the money that was being sent out from the GCC countries was going back to the Middle East, up until late 80s, early 1990s, up until there, is, there was the Gulf War. Now the money was being sent out from the GCC still, but where is it going now? It's going to South, South Asian countries. And you can see it actually uh, in that graph. So the idea here is, is actually uh, interesting on many levels. The first one, it shows that the GCC countries' labor policies have tremendous impact on the flow of, flow of remittances, the direction of the money. But also, if you, are, if you are a believer of the development impact of remittances, and the literature is very you know, big on this, and the debate is actually even bigger, then Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Yemen missed out on a lot of money and missed out on potential investments and potential consumption and potential plans that could have been done with this amount of money. And who are the, you know, the benefits in South Asia? Uh, you know, there's a, 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 we don't, the, the question you know, stops here. I, the, we don't have evidence beyond that. But if the you know, direction of money is different, 
then you can only wonder about the constant. I'm going to actually throw at you one uh, crazy theory in a second that I'm trying to uh, work on it. I tested this econometrically, and there is, a there is actually a structural break, which means the, the, the behavior of the time series of the money changes in 1990, which is exactly matches the first Gulf War. Now, if you look again, you, you're going to see that the you know, remittance to the Middle East picked up, got close to the outflows of the GCC, and then, again, it seems that, that there is a wide divergence. I don't know. This is still you know, work in progress. What's going on? We need actually more uh, uh, time series for that. But let me actually throw at you that crazy theory. When I was teaching uh, uh, my, my Middle East class in fall 2010, it was exactly October 2010, I told my students that, hey, you know, there is almost, there's 28 conflicts that occurred in the Middle East. And that, if you look at the, you know, since World War II, if you look at the time frame, uh, 60 years, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, it's, you're going to expect a serious war or a conflict every three years. And I said the last one was 2008, the Gaza war. Based on data, we should have one. Well, in, the, in December 10, Muhammad Bouazizi basically uh, and the Tunisian revolution started. And then after that, you guys know what happened. Unfortunately, I was right, and, uh, and, and, and it was beyond any, uh, you know, any imagination. So why am I telling you this story? Because the Middle East has the youngest population in the world. In fact, if you look at Syria, if you look at Iran, if you look at Egypt, if you look at Iraq, the median age is between, zero, between 20 and 25. So 50% of the population is under 20. The median age of Japan and the median age of Germany, 44. There's a big difference. Now, these guys are young. These guys are educated. The education improvements in the Middle East have been very, very uh, large. So what happened? They were able to come to the Gulf for, for jobs, but not anymore, because they were replaced by South Asian workers. So you're educated, young, frustrated. Muhammad Bouazizi from Tunisia could have been in the Gulf. Now, Tunisians went to France. That was the main destination. But because France and Europe was actually suffering from economic crisis, there were no opportunities for them and no opportunities in the Gulf. So my crazy theory is that labor policies in the Gulf and that change in nationalities has partial, or maybe partially, is behind some of the, what we had in terms of the you know, Arab Spring. So I'm going to uh, uh, finish with you know, uh, uh, just a few ideas about uh, the challenges. So we talked about remittances, and we talked about uh, in brief history. What, what are the challenges that we have? In terms of locally, in terms of the GCC, we have labor market challenges. The GCC countries were able to create, in the last 10 years, 7 million jobs. That's almost 1 million jobs a year. However, it's not the job creation that mattered. It's the type of job for the locals. I'm talking about the local workforce, the Emiratis and the Qataris. The, because of this, you can see locally that the unemployment rate among the local Emiratis is 14%. Among the female Emiratis is 28%. Among the Saudis is 12%. Among the Bahrainis and the Omanis is above 15%. So one important challenge is the type of job you create and how you, you know, bring in the local to actually for the job. Um, another uh, challenge is the competition that you know, I'm trying to you know, stand on the side of the locals, the competition that they face with hundreds and thousands and millions of foreigners who are more experienced actually and who are cheaper. In fact, Emiratis get paid 30% more for the same uh, uh, qualifications than locals. Now, regionally, so just the last minute, so regionally, what's going on in Egypt, Syria, and other countries is affecting potential labor policies in the future in the Gulf, just like we saw in 1990. And globally, shale gas and shale oil are becoming, because of technology, economically viable. And because you just go to Texas and you will see. And because of that, countries in the Gulf have to think about what will happen to the price of oil. And if at some point they, they, you know, they would be able to balance their budget, 
At the end of the day, the main idea is to educate the young and allow them a competitive or give them a competitive labor market. Thank you very much.